G'day everyone and welcome to the Trek Zone Spotlight. Matt Miller with you. Today's guest from Portal47.net, the Trekland trunk and all sorts of places, as well as the official Star Trek.com all those years ago. His name's Larry Demichek. He's the authority in all things Star Trek. He's joining me today to discuss the brand new Star Trek Discovery trailer. Joining me from LA is Mr. Larry Namichek. He's been on the show a few times before. Larry, thanks so much for your time. Hey, thanks for having me in. Now, we finally have new Trek to talk about. What are your first thoughts? <laughs> we finally have new Trek to talk about. It was going to have to happen sometime, Yay! right? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> exactly. Um, <laughs> well, it's, uh, there are a lot of details. I don't know what's been more surprising, the trailer or the continued reaction to the trailer in so many uh, negative ways. But no, I'm thrilled. It's, it's sometimes it's almost hard to, to uh, remember that we've been in the TV Trek desert for 12 years. And even though these crumbs have been coming slowly, they are coming. So I've been a little amused at the people that, that still think that this is all somehow gonna collapse but just because of the slowness of information coming out. But um, it makes complete sense that CBS, CBS All Access would wait and throw the biggest bang for the buck at the, at the upfronts, which is where they're trying to, to uh, they're gonna start bargaining for advertising rates. And uh, this is a streaming show, but there will be commercials for those who take it that way. So it makes sense that they would save their big, first big splash for the people they've got to impress financially. Because this is, as we know, this is gonna be a business. Even though Netflix around the world has made such a big investment in the show and, and pre-sold it so largely. Exactly right. And uh, I, I think it's a little bit symbolic then that one of the opening shots uh, in the CBS trailer at the upfronts was uh, two of our lead characters walking in a desert to symbolise what, what we the fans <laughs> have been going through for, for the 12 years, as you say. Yeah, yeah, that's, that's some really good double level uh, 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 yeah, imagery there for where we've been. Yeah. But that was... <laughs> That was shot in Jordan, which made history because it was the first time a, a Trek TV series had shot outside the country. And I mean, not until the last couple of uh, JJ movies, have, the Kelvin movies, have they shot outside for anything. So that was really exciting to hear they uh, busted the budget enough to do that. And of course, I don't, we don't know if it's connected or not, but the King of Jordan uh, is a big Trek fan a uh, and uh, you know, had been an extra on Voyager when he was the crown prince. So. Who knows if that had anything to do with it, but it didn't hurt. Uh, but it was amazing to see that. There's certainly a nice tie-in, I, I, I think, that, uh, that, that Trek has just um, made that possible. Uh, and, and he's went, went from being the Crown Prince to, uh, to hopefully and probably uh, having a role in, in some of the, the great location imagery that we're, we're going to see in Discovery. Right. Well, it certainly made an impact on the audience there and on the audience around the world, which, again, is... I guess fandom shouldn't surprise me by now, and I, I'm a fan, I have my own peccadillos too, but, uh, and I'm a big you know, background canon fan, but I, the reaction to the trailer and to everything so far has been, um, has been amazing. But then again, as I'm very quick to say, we've been here before, you had, uh, you know, uh, Next Generation had a huge pushback, Enterprise had the huge pushback. Now in history, looking back in, in hindsight, it seems ridiculous. There are little quaint little nods, mm. you know, before Wrath of Khan when the word leaked out that Spock was gonna be killed off because Nimoy wanted to at the time. Um, there, was a, there was a big consumer activist pushback with a marketing survey to show how much Paramount and the movie would lose in, in VCR rentals and in uh, box office and in licensing toys. If, uh, if it wasn't changed so that Spock didn't die. There was this big, th and of course, you know, Wrath of Khan is still the benchmark <laughs> for all Star Trek movies. So it's funny to look yeah. back at some of those, those moments. Um, and that's, but we've got so many new fans now that people don't have that kind of context to look back at. Now, that's not excusing anything. We all still reserve the right to critique the show. But for not having, you know, even now we say, well, we've seen some frames of the show now, so it's open season. Well, I, I mean, it, it is only a two and a half minute trailer. It's at least a 13 now, now 15 episode order, hours. And um, 
we don't know all that's going to unfold in the 15 hours. So, you know, as much as I may have an opinion mm -hmm. about the uniforms and background and all that, the trailer looks gorgeous. It's exactly what you would expect of something that's going to compete in today's, you know, television, peak TV time, American television. And uh, there are, as much as in fandom we think about how much we care about this, we have to remember there are a lot of suits, there are a lot of jobs at CBS and CBS All Access. Even though it's a bigger picture than just one series, a lot is riding on the success of this show, right? I think fans forget about that. Nobody wants it to fail, much less not be as good as it can be and not bring in as much revenue as it can. And I, I still think that the, uh, the DNA, even though Brian isn't there, the DNA of the series is, is pretty spectacular. So I, I have my moments and my tweaks, but, but willing to see what happens. Apparently a lot of fandom isn't though. <laughs> or the noisy, the noisy 10% of fandom. Well, and that's exactly right. And it's, and it's usually the most vocal fans are the ones that have a very strong opinion, usually in a negative sense, and they're the ones that, that feel the need to, uh, to, to share their opinion and, and say that this is all going to suck. Now, I certainly don't think it's going to suck, but I do wonder whether um, Discovery is in the, in the same boat as Voyager and Enterprise in that um, there, it's this tentpole series trying to prop up a network. Uh, as, as you know, Voyager and Enterprise were, were there trying mm -hmm. to hold up UPN and uh, that didn't quite work out and UPN became the CW. Um, do, you, do you think Discovery might uh, suffer the same sort of um, uh, network fatigue or network reach as it, as it might be? Well, I don't, you're, you're saying propping up a tentpole I, I see them, especially Voyager, as the flagship. I mean, they were going to launch this business enterprise, no, no pun intended, and what better way to, you know, what's, it, what's in your arsenal? What's the most surefire thing you can do to lead off with? And right, Voyager was the first show to air on UPN. Enterprise, not so much. But I wouldn't blame, I would not at all blame uh, the fate of UPN on Voyager and Enterprise, because those were both the highest rated shows on their network. There were a lot of other problems. Bad, bad rinky-dinky management turnover all the time. Uh, CBS basically finally had to take the UPN under its wing, and that's when everything changed for Star Trek. But um, I wouldn't, I wouldn't, I would not chalk up the demise of, of UPN to anything having to do with Star Trek. Star Trek were the bright shining lights of UPN. If not for Star Trek, UPN would have died much sooner. It was a human, a human and, and just the fact of what they were trying to do with the stations and where they were in the country and they were having to take the fourth and fifth and sixth choice stations. So that's, but it's a, it's a totally different model, obviously with All Access. It's a streaming service, it's customers, and that's, that's just inside the States. And as you know, it's Netflix, Aside from the Canada choices, the rest of the country, the rest of the world, is Netflix, which makes it very easy to market to. So um, I, I know that all access, the bean counters and the and the suits weren't happy that the lead-off show wasn't Star Trek. It was, you know, Christine Baranski's uh, The Good Wife spinoff. So, which is a great show, but it's not the worldwide oomph of a Star Trek. So it's coming. So you know they were disappointed to begin with, but you know plans. Things are in process. Things are getting there. Um, and, so yeah, and, and I think that's a good sign too that that they're willing to not rush this into production and, and suffer suffer a bad fate. Uh, that they that they want to get this right. And um, after a couple of different premiere dates, they've sort of uh, CBS has sort of closed off now and said it'll be released when it's released. Um, what's your tip on on a release date? or a release time. Right. Well, that's, the, that's see, the, that's why I don't get this fan meme, you know, among the 5%, the loud 10%, uh, that CBS hates this show. If they hated it, if they hated it, they wouldn't have commissioned it. They would have pulled the plug and they for sure would have said uh, with all, you know, with, with, with the delay problems and Brian leaving uh, American Gods competition, all of that. There would have been a, you know, hey guys, launch on January or you're out of here. 
you know? And then, okay, we gave you one shot. Get it out the door by May or you're out of here. We're, we're pulling the plug. That has not happened because everybody gets it, at least on the business bottom line. We're fans. We're all, all embroiled in the, in the canon and the look and the visualizing and the storytelling and what's going on there. And that's cool. That's passion. But there is a bottom line, you know, business angle to this. And I think unlike times in the past, there'll always be people who don't get it, who are nonetheless in a gatekeeper position. But they seems like they have given an awful lot of, of patience to the creatives in this case, uh, even as it's taken a while to get the show together. I mean, I, I laugh. I say like, you know, I've heard rumors that they recast the lead to Voyager before it got off the ground. Yeah, that's right, Genevieve. You know, uh, yeah, Genevieve Bujol. I, uh, I, I'm being facetious, but you know what I'm saying. We, we forget so, the minute some controversy of the day blends into, you know, golden sentimental history, it just kind of all gets swept up into the great tapestry of Star Trek. But in the moment right now, these things are, you know, screaming headline, red alert news headlines. And soon, you know, a year yeah. from now, two, that's what the, a year from now, two years from now, will this make a difference? Will any of this that we're, that's occupying so much airtime uh, in web space, will that really make a difference? I mean, it'll make a difference in some ways. Somebody will be cast and somebody's not. Some angle, some what if road will be taken and another one won't. And those all will be fun to deal with. But in the, the bottom line of the storytelling and the show telling, this is just taking up empty air because people are passionate and they're impatient and of course, and if nobody cared about the show, we wouldn't be doing all this anyway, right? <laughs> That's right. Well, there's something at, at, uh, I've decided at Trexone that um, all of these little articles that are coming out, I know there were changes to the visual effects team and uh, earlier on, Brian Fuller leaving, all of these sort of, I mean, Brian Fuller leaving is a, is a bigger story that, that I covered, but all these other little ones just, uh, as you say, they're inconsequential and it'll be released when it's released and, and it'll look as it'll look. Um, and there will be that 10% that'll, that'll absolutely hate it. And there'll be some other people like you and I that are sort of raising a, a Vulcan eyebrow to it and just going fascinating, uh, especially in some of the looks uh, of the characters and the sets. Uh, and I want to dive into that with you, Larry. I, want to, I would love to hear your thoughts, um, especially uh, on uh, the elephant in the room, those Klingons. What do you think? See, here's, what's, here's my thing. <clears throat> we've, we've obviously, Klingons play a big part in this now 15 hour uh, arc. Um, people are so upset about that. I'm, ever since the JJ Klingons, and those are alternate universe Klingons, so who knows you know, what led to that from the time of the Kelvin. Um, I'm willing to say that there's all kinds of, if the Klingons have really occupied a home world and colony worlds and been around for hundreds of years, I'm willing to stake some species diversity. I'm willing to take, you know, a little bit of new creator uh, stretching their wings creativity, right? But I'm willing to say, especially when it comes to the costumes and the uniforms or whatever you call that, um, we're in an earlier time. We've already come up with the, you know, it took 25 years to come up with the smooth head, bumpy head answer in Enterprise, <laughs> or even the debate about whether to answer it or not, right? Finally, finally mm -hmm. found a way in Enterprise and the wherewithal to do that and the people to bring it off. Um, and the retconned explanation of all the smooth heads in, in the original series of the 60s being, being selected, being kept that way for interaction with, with humans and the Federation. If you want to kind of go there, that's fine. And then I know the motion picture was only two years later after the last filmed episode in, in, you know, universe, in canon time. But you know you can play with that and massage that, like I do with my column in the in the official magazine. I'm, but you know, I don't think they're that different. I mean, you can get down and say, obviously, well, this was manufactured. This prosthetic is different than over here. I'm willing to see some species diversity, because if we've got that many planets, that many worlds, and if a current meme, if if Game of Thrones is so is such an, an effect on current television, that scope and that epic, epic quality. You know, for years people have said, fans have said, hey man, a Klingon miniseries would be great. Well, if you're gonna, if you're gonna show Game of Houses, <laughs> more or less, 
wouldn't a little bit more species diversity help that? I mean, I'm totally fine with the Klingons. My, my God, they did the, they did the obviously the, uh, you know, the yell to Stovokor at the funeral service. That's all intriguing parts of the story that will eventually be made clear. But I'm, I'm fine with the Klingons. I have, I have more worry about some of the Starfleet aspects. And I say worry, concern. I keep hearing uh, that we're not, everything in the trailer is not all, is, is, there's far more to the saga, to the look of it, than what we're seeing in the trailer. So. That's an interesting one, uh, mo moving into the bridge. Uh, it's certainly, for, for something that's, that's uh, pre, or 10 years before Kirk, Spock, and the Enterprise, uh, it certainly is a, a, a radical departure from, from what we've established uh, in the original series. But there again, do you think that, I mean, there are all sorts of different classes of starships, just as there are all sorts of different classes of uh, sailing vessels here on Earth. Um, do, you, do you think that there's, that there could be, you know, I mean, if you wanted to get really fanatical as, as we are, we, I mean, we're big fans, sort of saying that, that Starfleet went in one direction with bridge design uh, during the war, it, it needed to be more functional, like the Defiant. Uh, and then when they came along to the Enterprise, they had these exploratory vessels in the Constellation, in the Constitution class. Um, what are your thoughts on the bridge? Well, we can, you know, there's, there's a certain amount here that uh, is, like I said, is new creators flexing their muscle. Um, I know, I know, well, the Kelvin, the Kelvin aspects of Star Trek 09 were supposed to be prime timeline. Now, people had issues with that because the Kelvin bridge is 30 years before Kirk, 20 years before Pike's bridge. And it's, you know, yes, it is 40 years later in production uh, reality. And that's a hard, you know, that's a hard balancing act to go through. Enterprise did the same thing back in 2001. How do you do a modern show? Mm. This is the eternal question. How do you do a modern show and um, resemble uh, a technology that's supposed to be in real time, years beyond it, but in, in actual Earth time, TV time, you've got access to tools and procedures and, and a look, right? A technology that just mm. automatically, you fall out of bed and it seems like it's more advanced. How do you, how do you combat that and resolve it? Well, I, I, it's, it's hit me that part of this is just going to be the direction people are given because the hardest thing in the world is to tell creative, like designers, you know, of all the different guilds and areas, okay, um, here it is 2017, now go do this the way it was done in, 20, you know, in 1964, say, for the cage. But on the other hand, we don't look at historical recreation. If it's a World War II drama, if it's a restoration comedy, you know, if it's a Jane Austen setting, um, we know to go back and design for that period. It's looked at as period recreation, right? Historical recreation. So there's kind of a battle in Star Trek in production of whether you're gonna approach it as historical recreation of the future <laughs> versus just turning creatives loose to see what you can do in the current situation with visual effects and, and set dressing and interface and live, live set effects. It's a balancing act. And a lot of people, a lot of the fans who haven't got a history much beyond, you know, or it's really impressed in their memory beyond the J.J. movies are saying, how do you, why do you keep saying this is prime? It looks more like a J.J. bridge and a J.J. film uh, feeling with lens flares even than it does with the older TV series. Well, we're, we're just going to deal with that. Every era of TV, obviously the next generation looks differently than the original series as far as the production of the show. So that's just going to be a given. You're going to have that. Um, I don't know. What I, there's always canon. We spend all these years smoothing over canon. Um, we'll see. We st again, we still don't know what the story has to do with all of this, right? Maybe there will be answers in the story. It's 10 years before. It's still not exactly the same moment, and we may be a different arm of Starfleet. We may be, there may be extenuating circumstances on all these. So I'm, I'm keeping an open mind. But the bottom line reality is that's what's here and whatever happens, as long as it's said to be canon and prime, we will, we will work it out. Well, that's exactly right. And uh, I mean, I would, I would struggle to, I, I think I would struggle to watch a series that, um, uh, that was like the fan films that are out there that were so meticulous in the details. And James Corley's uh, New Voyages sets that, that are now a set tour are absolutely fantastic. And it's, and it's certainly nothing against those or the sets of continues. Um, but 
Uh, I don't think that a that a, a fully funded official series from CBS should be stuck in the 60s. I, I, I think that it's that it should embrace um, you know now time and the technology that's available. I mean, flat screens started coming into the enterprise era uh, there in in Nemesis. You saw those um, the monitors rise up out of out of uh, the the desks in Picard's office. Um, so you know maybe maybe they should have gone uh, further into the future rather than trying to tell uh, a story before Kirk but maybe the writers and, and Brian who, who started this whole journey um, saw a story that he really wanted to tell yeah no I you know I, I'm not with the no prequels crowd to me Star Trek especially even more so with the next generation because once the next generation's paradigm was busted out as 80 years in the future we're not rebooting or forgetting Kirk, Spock, and McCoy, they're part of our honored history, but we've moved on. Ever since that kind of blew everyone's mind, and again, there was, there was resistance to that, right? Um, mm. But ever since that became the norm and everything was branched out from that and based on that, uh, now you've got this huge sandbox to play in, and, and you've got different levels. If you're talking about alternate universes, you've got different levels of the sandbox. So on one hand, I worry that for everybody who wanted to go on beyond nemesis go on beyond uh, the end of the, the Berman era TV shows and movies into the future, maybe even like Star Trek Online, the game has done so well with their established, you know, very much adhere, figured out, pre-planned canon. Um, if we as a continuing, as, as the complexity of a TV production, if we have as a culture, as a society, as our awareness, and even as our production technology, has it really advanced far enough to be able to make a leap the way Next Generation was able to make the leap from the original series. Not just in saying, oh, we're going to go 80 years in the future, but do you have enough, has the real world carried along enough where you can bring that off? Has, have the creators, you know, has the texture of possibility been enriched enough by the real world where you can make a leap ahead of, ahead of where we are now, much less carry it off with real world production? So yeah, at the beginning of Next Gen, we're still using hey, we've got money to put real TV screens in the bridge, which they couldn't do in the original series in the 60s. It was too, the tech was beyond them, right? To shoot and film and light and all that. Mm. They were doing it in the 70s, in the 80s, in a limited way, roll out more of them for the movies with more time and more budget. And then that grew to the fact, to the time point where uh, flat screens had come in and the Enterprise bridge for Archer was full of flat screens. And that was 18 years and that was just mm. that arc. So my point was, have we advanced enough? It's only been 12 years since the end of Enterprise. Have we got the point where we can do that as a series? Now, obviously, the look of productions, the look of movies, whether it's the JJ's directing, whether it's this crew doing the TV series or not, TV is way different than it looks, especially on the streaming and the premium channel level, right? The dramas. That's a revolution the last 12, 15 years. And so, of course, they're gonna have to you know, meet up to that cinematography cinematographically, <laughs> but, um, the, you know, there's a big challenge. You said, how can we design for 1964? You're not, you're not building it like 1964, but you want it to look like 1960. I mean, there was a great conceit when DS9 did Trials and Tribulations, right? That was 30 years. They were honoring the 30th anniversary, but it was 30 years of production. So they wanted to have live models and show the Enterprise and show a D7, Klingon, orbiting K7. Well, they didn't have the original models. They wouldn't have worked. What they did was, the conceit was, to build the models with enough detail that, you, that, was, that was possible at the time so that if you took a long shot, it would look exactly the way it did in 1967. But when you pulled in close, you would see all this detail. It didn't mean that the detail wasn't there in 1967. It's just that we couldn't see it, right? But now that we're able to get closer, we see that level of detail. And that's the same, they brought that to the bridges, especially the bridge set they did for Intermira Darkly on Enterprise, right? It was the Defiant, but it was an Enterprise bridge. And there was more, you know, those static graphics just scream low budget, but they were actually able to introduce some low motion into that. So my point is, if you think of it as historical recreation, you don't build it the way they built it originally, but hopefully the effect comes off as the same. What you, what's, where you use your creativity 
is to bring to bear all the tools that you have now to make it look that way. Now, again, um, at least on the surface, at least what we're seeing in the early scenes, that's not the route they went into. So eventually we'll be doing a, a retcon, right, for this. Because I really think that Star Trek is a classic show, it's classic sci-fi, it's obviously a franchise that created the, no the notion of franchises. There's some reason why it's been around 50 years. I used to call it the five C's of Star Trek. And, and, but the fifth C, even though we love to make fun of it, we're all guilty of it, is canon. And I don't think Star Trek would, I mean, people love Twin Peaks and MASH and much less Star Wars and Doctor Who and Harry Potter. But uh, as far as the, the franchises with longevity, there's still nothing like Star Trek. I mean, Star Wars has been expanded by the expanded universe. It's there in the name, right? And there's the controversy about what that is these days. And now, ABC Disney's about to roll out an awful lot more f actual filmed Star Wars. And good on them. But there's still 740-something hours of film Star Trek uh, that just blows all of that away. And there'd, pro there'd be that many hours of Doctor Who if they hadn't erased half the tapes in the 70s, 60s. That's exactly right. Right. Well, Larry, we're fast out of time, uh, so I'm going to give you the final word. Um, final word on on Star Trek Discovery. Uh, your final thoughts uh, on on this trailer. Looking forward uh, to the series. I am excited, guys. I am so excited. We will deal with all the canon issues later. I have all the faith in the world in Brian's blueprint and in Aaron and Gretchen's team of writers and the designers they've done. You can tell the actors are excited. They're all thrilled to be part of the family. And I think the great silent armchair fandom majority out there is excited too as soon as they hear about it. And I think a lot of the things we're arguing about right now will, may still be around for a while, but I think once we get into the meat of the shows, we'll have the, we'll have the critiques and the feedback that we need. But you know, fandom's fandom, it's gonna happen, so I say let's bring it on, let's just get it here as soon as we can. And, and, uh, and good on them for getting there. Exactly right. Larry, thank you so much for your time, man. Really appreciate it. Hey, Matt. Track well. <laughs>